tonight, I want us to count our miracles. And I promise you, you're not going to be able to count all of them. I promise you. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. The Bible says, When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately, he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. As a testimony to them. Father God, in the name of Jesus, let your spirit fall fresh in this moment. God, we're awaiting on your arrival into this place. God, matter of fact, we feel your residue here now. We feel the presence of the Holy Spirit about to speak to us, about to let something loose inside of us, about to break up and, and uproot the things that we have buried deep inside because only you have access to take the negative roots inside of us and rip them out of us and burn them. So God, tonight, we ask that you just speak to us in a fresh way, in a convicting way, in a loving way, in a real, authentic way. And Jesus will give your name the honor, glory, and all the praise. And the people of God said amen and amen. <laughs> you may be seated. Tonight, I want to talk about a topic, and um, <clears throat> I remember the beginning of, I think this year we had like some, we were sitting on stage, and some of y'all help me if I'm if I'm forgetting. We were sitting on stage in a circle. I think this was after one of our uh, YA nights, and we were talking about different chains, and uh, we were talking about how rejection is one of those chains. How many people deal with rejection? Yeah. Keep it on it. How many deal with deal with rejection? I deal with rejection. The rejection hurts. And um, I think we've all dealt with a certain level of rejection. But what I love about the Jesus that we serve is that there is room for rejects. There's room for rejects. And um, can I tell y'all, like, I want to give y'all a story. It's pretty sad, but I'm going to tell it anyway. <laughs> um... I got rejected this one time, and um, y'all pray for me while I tell this, because I don't want to get emotional. But um, my wife rejected me before we got, <laughs> before we actually started dating. Um, it's emotional, y'all pray with me. Um, I remember when I first got here, and I don't know how it happened, but I've and I asked her to coffee, like, I ain't say, can we go to dinner? Y'all know dinner is a commitment. Yeah, dinner a commitment. Like, you got to pick out the place. You got to do this. You got to do that. In the third, you got to make sure your outfit tight. But coffee, you can low-key go to coffee with nice sweatpants on. Nice joggers. And um, I was like, man, coffee's going to be cool. We'll create a lot of conversation. And uh, little did I know, I was like, hey, would you like want to get coffee? And she was like... Not really. I was like, what? <laughs> I said, not coffee? Coffee ain't a commitment page. Coffee is something simple. It's just a drink. It's just a drink. If this was the bar, it'd be like, can I get you a shot? <laughs> like, let's keep it 100. I'm not talking about, don't go out and buy somebody a shot, y'all. This is not the type of sermon. I'm just trying to make it regular. But I'm literally like perplexed because she don't want to get coffee coffee. She don't want to get coffee. And I'm tight about it. So I was like, all right, whatever. You ain't that cute anyway. <laughs> it's, it's a straight lie from hell. She was so cute and I was so mad she said no. And um, the reality is we always go to this <laughs> we be like, yeah, I ain't want that anyway. Yeah, you did or else you wouldn't have asked for it. So she said no and then it put me into a season that I didn't know I was gonna go into. It was called waiting. <laughs> Rejection 
precedes waiting. Waiting follows after rejection. And I found myself waiting for three years just to ask her again, hey, do you want to go out? This time I did dinner. I said, do you, would you want to get dinner? This joker said, yeah. So if I would have said dinner the first time, how much turmoil will I have, would I have skipped? <laughs> so she said yes, and then the rest is currently being written. So here we are. <laughs> so that was the sad one. The lighter one is, um, actually, this is actually dark. <laughs> There is no worse rejection than being rejected by those that you've been a part of their tribe for half your life. You've been a part of their inner circle for half your life. You've been a part of their good times. You even covered up some of their scars for them because they could not cover it themselves. And I wanna talk about friendships, the rejection of friendship, not the ones that You've been friends for like two seconds. I'm talking about those ones where you have, you have shared tears with those people. You have shared your deepest, darkest secrets with those people. You have given of yourself to those people and in return, later down the road, you got rejection. I'll never forget some of the friendships that I've had, some of the significant friendships I've had. And when we're in these, these, these relationships, these friendships, we see them as being eternal. We see them as staying around for forever. And the reality is that some things have an expiration date. And that expiration date is tough because rejection is tough. Rejection is almost as if people are throwing us away, throwing us away. And this type of rejection hurt because there were times where you, you could have rejected them and left them for being a bad friend, but yet you stayed trying to be the good friend, but yet you were still having all of the energy, all of the happiness sucked out of you because you felt like they needed you or you felt like you needed them. And once they found out that they didn't need you, you felt rejected. Has anybody ever felt that way? <laughs> it is gut-wrenching because you hate to lose something that you invested in for so long. <laughs> That's why relationships are hard. That's why intimate relationships are hard because we've invested our time, we've invested our hearts, our emotions into these romantic relationships. Some of us have even, I'll be keeping 100, we've, some of us have invested our love, our body to these relationships, and it hurts even more because we have given people a piece of ourselves that was meant to be for our husbands, for our wives, but we, we fast forward it trying to make that person a wife or a husband when they weren't even wife or husband material. We just wanted to feel the warmth of them, and when they left, it was rejection. When they left, it was rejection. Social rejection increases anger, increases anxiety, increases depression, increases jealousy. Social rejection increases sadness. And what I've found out just from one, being a young adult and growing and, and talking to other young adults, talking to grown people, rejection is one of the things that often fuels us to act in certain ways. And it made me think, how many things have I grinded toward out of rejection? <laughs> and it ended up grinding me. It ended up making me tired. I started, I started that company just based off of rejection because somebody else didn't give me a chance. I dated this person because so-and-so rejected me. I re, I, you really a rebound, but I'm hopping on you because this person rejected me. I did all these things out of rejection. I did all of these things out of a place of hurt because my sadness was increased, my anger was increased. I've, I've never been so angry than when I get rejected by somebody I invested in. You're never more angry than you, when you get ripped away from a group where you did most of the, you collected these people, you brought these people together and all of a sudden you are the odd man, woman out. Yeah, we don't want to kick it with you no more actually. Like we actually doing our own thing. They got a group chat outside of your chat. 
And the reality is that we want to pretend like we not hurt and we not mad, but deep down inside we are burying. It is, all, it is funny because you got to ask yourself this question. Are we burying our emotions to make other people comfortable? <laughs> Because we don't want them to know that we're angry at them, like, oh, I'm going to be the bigger person. Sometimes being the bigger person is a stupid route. <laughs> I keep it 100. Like, sometimes being the bigger person is more hurting than just being the person who is hurt. Because we see hurt as a weakness. We see being hurt as being weak. When in the matter of fact is, I am going through the process of rejection. I was rejected. So, in reality, I should be able to be sad to be angry and not feel weird for being that way. Not feel ridiculed for being angry about being rejected. You know how you talk to some people and this tell you about your friend group. Oh, I'm so glad they, they why they leave me, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, well, get over it. <laughs> you be like, hold on, it just happened. <laughs> it's fresh, this cut is fresh. I'm not saying that you shouldn't get over it, but I do say that it takes time to get over some things. It takes time to get over some things. But what I love about Jesus is that there is room for rejects in his group. There's room for rejects, people who have been rejected. There's room for us in his group. Jesus did not deny rejects. Matter of fact, it's almost like he had a radar to seek them out. I love that about God. He seeked out people that nobody else wanted to talk to. And I love this, 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 this line of scripture that we're going through because it talks about leprosy. Leprosy was this disease that was shown on the outside and it was like a skin disease. And the crazy thing is about people with, who were lepers, they had to announce that they were coming into an area. They had to shout out, unclean, unclean. Imagine if you had to shout out all your insecurities and stuff inside of you. Broken, depressed. And then you see people like, get away from them because they're a leper. That's how lepers felt. Unclean, unclean. And you watch people part like the Red Sea. And some of us are going through this, leper, this, lep, this, this leprosy season and we not even shouting out, broken, angry, upset, anxiety. People just move out the way when we walk into the room. <laughs> Friends start to remove themselves when we just get around them. Like, oh, no, nah, she, she, she depressed. Let's get away from her because you know she's going to be sad all the time. Let's get away from him because you know he's going to cry. A lot of us feel like a leper <laughs> a leper and what's crazy about this leprosy is known to occur at all ages from early infancy to very old age rejection depression don't have no age limit I know young people who, who are uh, depressed. I know old people who are depressed. I know young people who are rejected. I know old people who are rejected. So leprosy, AKA rejection, has no respect for person. It is what it is and it does what it does. Y'all with me? The reality of this leprosy that we're talking about is, the crazy part is leprosy could be seen on the outside, but some of the stuff, rejection, is often on the inside. And I can only imagine, yeah, it's cool that they got healed by Jesus, that he, he healed their leprosy, but I wonder how their life went after the fact. What was the time period where they actually felt like they were healed? Because yes, it was healed on the, on the outside, but what was also healed on the inside? Imagine you finally get whatever that, you, you get that thing fixed, like, okay, yeah, I can get my nose or something wax off my face, but it still doesn't fix the insecure thing inside of me that made me go get that thing fixed. Does that make sense? Yeah, I can get rid of the skin thing that's on me, but I can't fix the thing that is inside of me. So I wonder what it felt like to walk around, to not have to see, not have to scream out, unclean, unclean, but inside, unclean, unclean, broken, broken, but inside, broken, broken, being sad, being 
made feel like you cannot talk about what's going on inside of you. Because you gotta remember, they didn't have psychologists back in this time. <laughs> they didn't get to talk about like, okay, I got healed by Jesus, how do I move forward? <laughs> They didn't get to go talk to a therapist after they had received, I got my spots cleaned up, I don't have leprosy anymore, but how do I continue to walk the rest of this journey out? Because I was a leper, I, was, I had leprosy for several years. I didn't have it for a month. I had leprosy for several years. I've had depression for several years. How do I get over that? How do I move on? Now, it's healed on the outside, but how do I heal it on the inside? How do I fix it on the inside? How do I talk to myself daily and say that I'm not a leper anymore, I'm healed. I'm healed on the outside, but I still feel like a leper on the inside. I still feel like nobody sees me on the inside. I still feel like people are looking at me crazy on the inside. <laughs> I walk into a room and because you have to remember, those people still remember those lepers as it were, because they saw him for their face. So imagine them going back into a crowded area and people are still looking at them like, oh, wait a minute, aren't you a leper? And be like, no, I'm not a leper no more. <laughs> I'm healed. Imagine you walk into a place where you had, you, you had depression, you, got, you go see a, uh, a therapist and all this stuff, and when you walk into a room, people are still moving away from you like you got the plague. Like, oh, hold on. <laughs> imagine that feeling. We all know what rejection is. We just don't like talking about it. <laughs> We don't like discussing rejection because it's such a hard topic. It's such a, a reality check that like, yes, I'm experiencing rejection. We just want to say like, oh no, I'm just experiencing some sad times. No, you actually might be experiencing rejection. And it is okay to go through the sequence of rejection. It's okay to question, how do I get to the next step? It's okay to question, how do I pick myself up internally the outside is cool. I, I fixed all that stuff. But how do I fix the inside? The inside is the thing that I'm concerned about. The inside is what I can't change. I can change my appearance, but I can't erase my rejection. I can't erase my rejection. And what I have had to find out in my own personal journey is that, mm, what I've had to figure out on this is we are all lepers, but based on who you seek to heal you will determine how long you stay a leper. Based on who you seek to heal you will determine how long you remain a leper on the inside. Because if you notice, the lepers went to go see Jesus. We often go see other lepers. <laughs> we don't always seek Jesus. We go see other lepers. Let me go talk to one of my friends who depressed. Because <laughs> they'll understand where I'm coming from. And I'm not saying that's bad, but if you actually want to be healed, you have to go some, to somebody who is already over what you're trying to be healed over. Does this make sense? I have to go see somebody who can actually help me with what I'm going through. Because if I kick it with the same people who are going through the same stuff I'm going through, I won't be able to rise up. I won't be able to switch over the mindset that I have. I won't be able to get over these feelings of rejection in my mind because I'll just be in a room full of a pity party. <laughs> We don't want to go to Jesus sometimes because we know he can actually fix it. Yeah. How, how many of us have prolonged a rejection period because we're getting a lot of attention from it? Let's keep it all the way 100. Y'all know I'm not coming here to, to talk, be like, and be gentle. No, we're going to throw a little bit of neosporin on some of this stuff and it'll burn for a minute. But then we'll wipe it up and we'll be good. But right now in this moment, we have to be real with ourselves. Some of us are okay with the pity party because we get a certain level of attention that we have not received. Because of rejection, when we get that attention from people who know we're going through something, it'd be like, oh, finally somebody see me. And I wanna continue to be seen, so even if I am getting over it slowly, I'ma pretend I'm still feeling rejected. Because broken people can't heal other broken people. <laughs> Only healed people can help heal broken people. When you still kick it with broken people, you are still, and you wonder like, why am I still in this same cycle? Because the group you around. It's the group you around. Friend, who are your friends? <laughs> Who's your friends? Because some of our friends, 
don't need to be in our lives. Is that fair to say? <laughs> I don't even want to call them friends because a friend is forgiving, uh, ooh, reliable, thank you, nourishing and devoted. That's a friend. That's our definition of friend. So who is that? Get me a shirt. I see that plug. <laughs> Who are we giving the title of friend who is actually a Pharisee? <laughs> who are we giving the title? And what's a Pharisee? A Pharisee is the people who was talking about some, yeah, Jesus ain't the king. Jesus is not the son of man. The Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, were the ones who were trying to kill Jesus to, start, to try to say that he is not the son of man. They weren't friends. So who are we giving the title of friend to that's actually a Pharisee who points at our, all of our insecurities, who points out like, dang, you still not over that? No, because I'm still kicking it with you and you keep piling it on. <laughs> I'm not healed over it because you broke it. You might be even more broken than I am and I can't help you fix your broken stuff because I'm trying to fix my broken stuff. All these terrible people are trying to fix each other's terrible mess and they won't go to the person who actually can heal it because then it will be gone. And what do you do when the thing that was giving you strength in one season is gone and it forces you to go find strength in something else that will sustain you in the new season that you're in now? Y'all know how I always say like, yeah, don't get rid of my depression because it was a warm blanket. I don't be playing about that. Some people will actually stay depressed because it comforted them in one season. Anger comforted, comforted us in one season. And because we, we figured that was a formula, because it made us grind better and made us uh, do more work, our anger pushed us, our jealousy pushed us. We think that's the formula for success when it's actually the formula for sickness. It's leprosy. <laughs> leprosy is known. It's social rejection. That's what that is. That's not motivation. That's social rejection. When one group rejects you, when that business rejects you, when that person rejects you, when that area of field, when that school rejects you, you get into a place of like, I'm going to prove them wrong. <laughs> I'm going to prove to them I can do it. What about proving it to you? <laughs> We forget about ourselves because we're so worried about impressing other people. We're so worried about proving other people wrong. I'm not jealous. I'm not, I don't feel rejected. We'll, we'll yell out those things. Unclean, unclean. We'll lie. I'm healed, I'm healed. No, I'm not. I'll scream hallelujah in church, but I'll scream what is going on at home in my car ride. There are times when I've preached a crazy sermon. I'll be like, hallelujah, y'all know all the screaming I'll be doing. And then I'll come off of this stage and get an insecure thought in my head right off. That is the reality because when you start to preach against the thing that is talking to you so loud and it's waking you up in the middle of the night, it's talking to you while you're driving, it's talking to you while you're washing your face, it's talking to you while you're putting on your good clothes, going on date night, it's talking to you all the time. And when you start to preach against that thing and you start to rebuke that thing, it starts to get louder. It don't get quieter. It gets louder. But... How can we know how to talk to it if we only remain in the reject room? If we stay in the season of rejection, if we don't go look for somebody who can help us heal the problem. The lepers weren't going around looking for physicians. They was going to look for the one physician. <laughs> they were going to look for the one man who they had heard did it for somebody else. And you know how much faith it takes to go on a whim? <laughs> to go seek Jesus on a whim like I heard he did it for somebody else. I don't even know if he can do it for me. But they had so much faith to say, Father, if you are willing, look at their humbleness. If you are willing can you heal us of this leprosy? How many of us are saying, God, if you're willing to heal me of this rejecting feeling? No, we tell him, say, God, give me vengeance. <laughs> Help me. Yeah, put my, I, my enemies will be my footstool. That's what we want to do. Because we are so carnal. <laughs> We're so carnal minded. We want to get back at people. We want to make, we're experiencing jealousy and we want to make other people jealous. 
How toxic is that? We're angry and we want to make other people angry. Y'all see the patterns that we create? Not even intentionally, on accident sometimes. I'm sad, I want everybody else to be sad. I want everybody else to be sad. But there has to come a time where we stop worrying about and where we stop pity partying, where we stop trying to make other people jealous, trying to make other people angry, trying to do all this stuff to get ahead in life. And it has to come down to, do I actually want to be healed? Because there is something about me that I can't get over this hump. I've been carrying this weight for like, tw for like two years and these people not even thinking about me no more. They don't even remember my name, let alone remember what they said to me. So why am I carrying the bags of my past when I could be walking into my future with no bag? Why am I worried about this? We are missing the move of God because we are worried about something somebody said to us in high school. We are missing the move of God for our life because we are angry about what somebody said at the last uh, Thanksgiving we had with our family. We mad about that because they didn't say sorry about it and we are still, every time we see them, yeah, I can't wait to see our Susie. Can't wait to tell her off and let her know how, how much of a success I am. We're so angry. And you know who catches that anger? The friends who are actually friends. <laughs> that group of people in your life who are actually trying to push you forward, they catch all that anger. <laughs> they catch all that hate. They catch all that resentment. You be like, hey, like, you know, that happened like a few years ago. You gotta get better, you gotta progress, you gotta get on the other side. You gotta see how the story is gonna end. They're like, nope, nope, I wanna get them back. Because what they said to me two years ago, I wanna get them back. Y'all, we are petty, God is not. We are petty, God is not. Pe hear me, Pastor Lincoln is petty, and I love it. <laughs> I love it, it makes me feel great sometimes. But I have to wrap it up because I'm a pastor. But, <laughs> My pettiness is jokey pettiness. But the reality is, if I allow my pettiness to outweigh my godliness, then how can I tell people to forgive people if Pastor Lincoln can't forgive anybody? How can I tell other people, you need to be on your knees, but I ain't doing it. <laughs> you need to be lifting up a shout of praise, but I don't know how to scream a hallelujah in the darkest of night. <laughs> There has to be a tug and pull. There has to be like, God, I'm going to do, if you do your part, I'm going to do my part. If you continue to push me forward, I'm going to try to even step a little bit forward. If you're willing, God, can you heal me? That's what the leper said to him. Some of us are lepers. We're walking around with this thing inside of us that we feel like everybody can see, but in reality, only you can see it. Only you experience it. Write this down. Write this down. Rejection forces us into isolation. Rejection forces us into isolation. I don't want to talk to nobody. Everybody leave me alone. I'm going for some, I just need some me time. <laughs> All that me time to help you think more disgusting and terrible thoughts. <laughs> by yourself. We are our best hype man in the worst way. <laughs> I can't wait to get them back. <laughs> oh girl, <laughs> when, I, when my edges get back, I'm gonna stun on these people. <laughs> when I get my eyebrows done, I don't know why I'm getting ghetto. <laughs> uh, I told you if I get ghetto, y'all gonna go with me. So the reality is we are so, we talk to ourselves in such a way that is not healthy, and then in return, we put that negative talk on people. We turn all our anger on people. We put all of our frustration on people. And it's usually the healthy people. We put all of our unhealthy stuff on healthy people. And they be like, ooh. And then we wonder why they don't want to kick it with us. Ooh. How come nobody want to kick it with me? Because you're negative. Every time I talk to you, something wrong. You mad about McDonald's fries. You mad about something like somebody said to you, the fries was cold. It's McDonald's, y'all. They gonna be cold sometimes. <laughs> but nobody wants to be around anybody who is angry 24 seven. It's draining. Nobody wants to be around somebody. Oh, Holy Ghost, help me say this right. Nobody wants to be around anybody 
when you tell them something one time, two times, three times, I can't even count them all how many times I have told you the same advice and you still do the same thing. <laughs> I'm only saying this because I have been that person and I've also had to do that to other people be like, I don't want to talk to you no more. You keep doing the same thing. Is that just me or does anybody else deal with somebody who'll be like, I, why do you call me? I'm gonna tell you the same thing every time. Stop sleeping with him, stop sleeping with her. Why are you calling me? You already know what you need to do. Can I percolate thought that that's what Jesus does to us too? <laughs> We'd be like, God, I'm looking for a sign. He'd be like, there it go. <laughs> You'd be like, no Lord, I need like a sign sign. He'd be like, there it is. <laughs> We don't like how it's wrapped. We, we can't stand the way God wraps our gifts. Oh, yes. We don't like the way that God wraps the gifts that he's giving us. <laughs> we are arguing with the God of all gods, with the creator God, with the God who breathes and the wind moves with him. We are saying, God, I don't like the way you wrap that gift. Can you give me something else? Like, like it's, what? We're arguing with the God who decided to give us grace, to give us mercy, who said, I will give you this gift. I will endure you with power of the Holy Spirit. I'll send the Holy Spirit to be a comforter. And we're saying, I don't really like the way that you talked about that. I don't really like the way you wrapped that up. What is going on? And then we wonder why we'd be like, well, where is God at? He's been talking to you the whole time. You just can't hear. We just can't hear and then we feel like God has rejected us. Ooh. God is not rejecting us. We are rejecting the way that he speaks and moves and works in us. We don't like the method. So therefore we like, God don't hear me. No, he heard you, but he wants you. God is a God that wants you to grow. He don't want you to stay in the same place. God is a God who will push us into obscurity, who will push us into uncomfortability and be like, grow. <laughs> Because he knows what's best for the plant. that he, he knows the right soil to put us in. We are seeds. He knows the right soil to put us in. And soil ain't comfortable. It's dirty. We'd be like, oh, it's dirty around here, God. Why you got me in here? He'd be like, dummy, if you would just wait. <laughs> wait on me. Listen to me. Read my word. I could heal you. I could change your life. We don't want to get dirty on the way to redemption. <laughs> We don't want to get dirty on the way to healing. We think that healing, this is one thing, I'll say this, I won't speak for y'all. I used to think that the journey toward healing would be like a little bit nicer, like a little bit greener. Healing is dirty. <laughs> the road to healing is dirty, it's frustrating, it's hard, it's an emotional roller coaster. You go up one way, you come down one way. You, you feel like you're about to get to the mountaintop, like I'm getting over it, and then be like, bloop, nope, you're not done yet. You're like, God, I want to be healed. I want to be set free. And you know what God says? How bad do you actually want it? Because if you do want it bad enough, you would know that this is the requirement. <laughs> you got to be a certain height to even get on the ride at Cedar Point. God is saying your heart has to be at the right height. You have to be in the right position to get on this ride called healing. And if you are not the proper height, if, you're if your heart is not in the proper position, you can't even get on the ride. It's a liability to the kingdom if I put you on this ride and you're not at the right height. You gotta be, your heart has to be in the right position, fam. Your heart gotta be in the right place in order to get healed. If your heart is still in rejection mode, how can you even think about getting on the ride of healing? You can't get on a ride that you are not the required height to be on. It's not, oh, it's not safe. It's not safe for you to get on the ride if you're not at the right height. They tell people with heart problems, if you have heart problems, don't get on the ride. <laughs> if you got heart problems, you might want to wait to get on this ride of healing. But also, I dare think that God sometimes says, get on at your own risk. <laughs> because sometimes God is saying, I wanna see what they would do. I wanna test their faith. 
are they getting, are they seeing the roller coaster as a journey? Like, oh, it's gonna, or <laughs> are they looking at the expiration time of the roller coaster? Are they looking how long it is, how big it is? Are they looking at it like, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not going to fear no evil, for thou art with me. How are they looking at it? And I want to know, how are we looking at our situation? Are we looking at how long it'll take us to get over this stuff? Are we looking at it like, I'm going to get on this ride because I know the end result of this ride. I don't care how high we go up and how low we come down. I know the Jesus that'll bring me up. He will keep me safe. He'll strap me in. He will lock me in. I don't have to worry about all the jerking that life is going to send me. I don't have to worry about all of the, the sickness that I feel when I come up and I come down. I know that I'm on the ride with the right person who will keep me safe. I'm on the ride with Jesus. I'm on the way to healing from rejection because I'm getting on the ride. You don't think it was a ride for the lepers to go look for Jesus? Y'all, this ain't the time when they had GPS. You heard on a whim, Jesus was in this area. And if Jesus was in, say Jesus is in Niles, you had to walk to get to Jesus. It was a journey. Woo, my, 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 my. It was a journey for those lepers to get to Jesus. They didn't have a GPS. They couldn't drive to Jesus. They had to walk. And this was the level of desperation they had to get healing. They had already heard enough about him to go seek him. And how many of us are waiting to still hear a certain amount about God? We still waiting to hear a certain amount of songs about God and we still won't go see Jesus. We don't need to know everything about Jesus to go seek him. We know enough about him. And if you don't know enough about him, you can get to know enough about him. But once you know that he can heal, he can set free, right there should be good enough for you to be like, I'm going to get on this journey. I'm going to find Jesus. Can you imagine the woman with the issue of blood was talking about some, well, if Jesus ain't around me, I ain't going to get him. If Jesus don't come in my eye gate, I'm not going to get him. And that is what some of us are saying. If Jesus don't come to me, I'm not going to him. And it's a tough pill to swallow because that's how we treat Jesus sometimes based on our season. Not all the time. It's based on the hardness of the season. Some of us are in seasons right now where it's tough to even want to talk to Jesus, let alone go find him. Because we're dealing with rejection. We're dealing with anger. We're dealing with anxiety. We're dealing with all this pain. And we're saying, God, why would I want to talk to you, let alone look for you? I'm feeling this way and I haven't heard from you since. And maybe Jesus is like, you got to come find me. I will heal you if you just believe. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man and said, I am willing because the man said, Lord, if you are willing, how much faith does this leper have? He traveled all this way to get to Jesus, walked through, through people to get to Jesus and said if you want to <laughs> not please do it he said if you want to Lord if you feel like it he didn't want to inconvenience Jesus Jesus I know who you are I know what you do I don't want to inconvenience you but if you're willing can you just touch somebody like me I know that I'm unclean but I've heard that you like unclean people I heard that there's room for rejects in your crew I'm trying to sign up can, can I have a sign up please and you know what Jesus said I am willing I am willing I am willing and I woke up this morning to tell somebody God is willing but are you willing are you willing? Are we willing to go after Jesus and say, God, if you are willing, and if he says no, are we still going to believe him? <laughs> if Jesus says not right now, will we still trust that he'll do it later on? That's the season I'm in. Lord, will you do this? And he'd be like, just wait a little bit longer. And our I don't know if y'all have noticed this about Jesus. Uh, my wait a little bit longer and Jesus' wait a little bit longer don't match up. <laughs> and that's how it's supposed to be. <laughs> my thoughts are not his thoughts. My ways are not his ways. But because I'm going to the right source, 
I have the right person. I have the right resource that I'm tapping into. There's room for me in this spot. There's room for me in his courts. It's room for me in his crew. He, he loved rejects. He loved them. And I'm one of them. <laughs> I am a hardcore reject. And Jesus said, come on in. <laughs> come on in, man. You family now. All I had to do was say, Jesus, come into my life. I want to be saved. I believe that you died and that you rose from the grave in three times. Forgive me because I'm a sinner, but I want to be saved and I give you my life. And you know what Jesus said? Come on in, fam. We got healing. We got joy. We got everything you need. You stay with this crew, I promise you, you're going to be in good space. Matter of fact, I'll have your eternity already set up. That's what Jesus says. Rejection forces us into isolation. But write this down. Revelation forces us into seclusion. Revelation forces us into seclusion. The difference between isolation and seclusion is isolation is done out of fear. Isolation is done out of sadness, out of fear of something. We all went into isolation called quarantine last year. But seclusion is where Jesus would go to hear from the Holy Spirit. Seclusion. He would go into a place where no one else was and he would fast in the wilderness. The Spirit led Jesus to the wilderness. Revelation forces us into seclusion. How many of us want real, authentic revelation for our lives? I mean like real revelation for our lives. If you want real revelation, you want to know what God wants to do with your life, with your seed, with your promise, with your skills, with your anointing, I dare you to go into seclusion. I dare you to take some time with Jesus. You know that drive on your way to work? That's a good time to be secluded. You know that time when nobody else is in your house, just you, in your room? You can go in your closet. That's a good time for seclusion. And say, Jesus, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to help my family members save? What do you want to do in me? And then what do you want to do through me? How do you want to use me to help somebody live a better story? What do you want from me, God? And whatever it is, I'm bowing down and saying, I'll do it. My yes is your yes. My no is your no. That is the level of revelation you will receive when you go into seclusion. In my restoration, when I was rejection, when I was rejected, Jesus didn't make me normal. He made me whole. When Jesus healed the leper, he didn't make him normal. To outside people, it made it seem like he made them normal because he healed them of all the skin stuff they had going on, he made them whole. Jesus doesn't make you normal. He makes you whole. He reaches deep down inside and he says, yeah, everything that was broken, everything that's a half inside of you, I'm making it a whole right now. I'm making you whole. I'm not here to make you normal. I'm here to make you whole. I'm here to make you whole. Y'all with me? This is the moment in time where we have to truly hear the voice of God. In this, this season of our life, young, old, whatever, this is the season to literally ask for revelation for your life. How many of y'all are just like, I don't know what to do with my life or I'm trying to figure out what to do with my life. I'm trying to figure out who I am as a person. Who am I this? Who am I that? How, for real, how many of y'all are, are, are in that phase? We all in that phase. We all like, what do I do? How many of us are going through something that we had something happen and we like, all right, who am I now after this thing? Like, who am I now after I'm graduated? Who, are, who am I now as a wife, as a husband? Who am I now as a single? Who am I now as a boyfriend or girlfriend? Who am I now? Who, who's going through that? Who am I now in this season? Who am I now? Can I tell you that you find that out in seclusion? You find that out when you seek the voice of God. If you feel rejected by the world, that's okay. You were never meant to be in it. <laughs> you were never meant to be in it. The Bible says that we were called, we were set apart. You know what set apart means? You might be lonely for a little bit. 
You might be by yourself for a little bit. Can I tell you that through prayer, through fasting, and actually understanding what God meant by separated, I have found joy in separation. I found joy in separation, that I'm separated from people who were dragging me down, that, I've, that I'm separated from old mindsets, old habits. I'm separated because I am whole in my separation. I'm not broken in my separation. I'm whole in my separation. I found out that God truly has a plan for my life because of what he showed me when I got separated from the world, when I got separated from that friend group, when I got separated from the things that were trying to separate me from him, when I got separated from those things. Everybody close their eyes real quick. Everybody close their eyes. I want you to dig deep in this moment. This wasn't a preachy sermon. This wasn't a, I know I asked y'all to say all the amens in the world, but this wasn't that type of sermon. I want us to know certain things. I want to debunk certain things. Last week we were talking about so many things and the week before that we were talking about we're the fruit of the tomb. I want you to know that there's room for rejects in the family of Jesus. He loves rejects because in rejection he gives revelation. When people throw you away you thought you, th you got thrown away and you fell on your face. You actually fell right into the arms of Jesus. It was a catch when they threw you, when life threw you. This is the moment, this is the time to know that your rejection was not an accident. It was a setup. <laughs> it was a setup for something better, something more. It was a setup to get you to the place where actually God wanted you to be and where you needed to be. You needed to be separated from them because he's working on you now. You need to be separated from that significant other. Not only were they not worth your time, but they weren't worth God's time. <laughs> God wanted you, so he called you. He called who we wanted. He chose who he wanted, and it was you. But here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. When God calls you out of something, he may send you back to it. And it's not for your glory, it's for his glory. He may send those friends that you left, that he pulled you out of, he may send you back to them to show them that they can change too. That they can find the person that you found, which was Jesus. Mm. Don't let this moment slip by. This room for you at the cross, this room for you. Don't you think, don't you let the enemy think. Don't you let the enemy make you think that there's no room for you in the kingdom of God because of everything that you've done. You're not too dirty. You're not too spoiled. You're not old. You're not this. You're not, you're not too young. You're not too old. You're not too this. You're not too that. You are just right for God to do something amazing in your life. You haven't messed up enough for God to throw you away. You've messed up just enough to get in the presence of God. Open up your heart in this moment. I want to give us a chance to rededicate our lives or dedicate your life if you haven't. If you want to start a new relationship with Jesus, just between me, you, and God, because everybody's eyes is closed and heads is down and all that stuff online. If you want to start a fresh relationship, if you want to join the crew of Jesus where all rejects are welcome, I just want you to slip your hand up. It's just you, me, and God. Yeah, you want to try out. Try Jesus. You've tried everything else. Try Jesus. If you want to try Jesus tonight, I just want you to slip your hand up. Come on, don't be scared. Don't be backward. 
I see you. I see you. Yeah, yeah. You can put your hand down. For those of you who know Jesus, have walked with Jesus, sang about Jesus, got Jesus on your t-shirt, tatted on you, and even with the tattoo that you have or the shirt, you still don't feel like he's close. And you want him. No, you want to be closer to him. You want to be closer to him. I just want you to slip your hand up. You just want to be closer to Jesus. You know him in the part of your sins. You have a relationship with him, but you just want to be closer to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to be closer to him. So close to him that you can feel the warmth of his love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, put your hand down. Everybody can stand on their feet. Let's stand on our feet. You can open your eyes. I'd be like, God, I'm in a preachy mood. And he'd be like, nah. <laughs> I don't want you to tune up or anything like that. Because my people don't need that right now. My people need to know that I got room for them. I got room for them. Not in a club, but in a family. And I'm afraid that, and I'm just going to speak to young adults right now. I'm afraid that we don't know the family that we have waiting for us because we're scared to take that next step, to take that next commitment. There is so much better on this side, y'all. <laughs> There's so much healing on this side. There's so much peace. What's that I'm going to talk about? Jesus is. Jesus loves you so much. So much. He knows about your rejection and still he chose you. He knows about your sin that you did two years ago or last night. He knows about all that. And yet, he still put breath in your lungs and said, wake up. You got to start today. Isn't it amazing to know a Jesus with so much grace, so much love? But I'm so afraid that we're going to allow our rejection from man to distract us from the redefining of, from God. When you get rejected, I dare say that that's just Jesus redefining you. When you get rejected from people, when you get rejected from things, that's just Jesus saying, I'm just switching your role. <laughs> I'm switching your reality in this season. You used to be that, but now I got to pull you away from that. You're going to feel rejected, but you're going to feel rejuvenated also. If you just stick with me, I think God is doing something different in our lives. We wanted him to kind of do the same thing. God, do it again. He'd be like, no, nah, I'm going to do something different. And the difference is going to make us uncomfortable. But all of that uncomfort, it'll make us whole. Does anybody want to be whole? <laughs> I mean, like, whole. And what does whole mean? I want to feel peace that surpasses my understanding. I want to feel peace that confuses me while everybody else is freaking out. I want to feel love when I don't got no significant other. I want to feel confident while I'm single so I don't have to depend on somebody else to love me. I want Jesus to love me so I know what love feels like and I can decipher, I can discern what real love is. I can discern what a real man, what a, what a godly man is from a worldly man. So I can discern what a godly woman is from a, from a, God, from a worldly woman. I want to know, I want to be able to receive, I want to be able to hear the voice of God. I want to be whole. Does anyone be, want anybody want to be whole? Want to be whole? Want to be whole? Want to be whole? I don't want you to come here. Oh, oh, Father God, in the name of Jesus, let's get out of our minds right now. Get out of our heads right now. 
Y'all, for real, for real. Let's let's get out of our heads. Let's get out of our heads. Let's get out of our heads. Whatever's going on after this or before this, whatever, whatever happened, let's get out of our minds real quick. Because it's 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 it, the devil is still trying to trick us into thinking that we are left alone. He's like, yeah, well, as soon as you leave this service, you're gonna be just as alone as you were before you got here. But I'm rebuking all of that. When you leave this house, when you log off of that computer, you log off of that phone, you're going to feel a difference in your life because there's room for your rejection. There's room for you. There's room for you. There's room for you. Quit worrying about impressing other people. All you got to do is impress Jesus. And you know what impresses him? Your yes. Yeah, God, I'm giving you this. I'm giving you that. If we would just stop worrying in our waiting, God can work. God wants to do something in your life. I promise you. I promise you. He wants to do something in your life. And I know that can be confusing. Like, well, what does he want to do? He hasn't shown it to me yet. Why ain't he showing it to me yet? Because you're looking for the different version of what he wants to do in your life. He's going to do what he wants to do in your life, not what you want him to do in your life. You gotta be okay with that. You gotta be okay with that. Mm. 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 Woo! It's heavy in here. <laughs> and that's okay. I know why it's heavy. Because it's hard to hear. I gotta let go of my feelings about that. I gotta let go of my anger about that. I gotta let go of this. I gotta let go of that. I gotta do that. Pastor Link, that's what fueled me for so long. And now you want me to let go of it? I don't want you to let go of it. Jesus does. <laughs> I'm not even going to try to attempt to do something that only God can. I'm going to pray over you. And then we can. <laughs> Ooh, the Holy Spirit is just smacking me upside my head. You know how your parents right upside the head? That's what the Holy Spirit is doing to me. Because I see what's going on right here in this moment. And I'm trying to rush out. But God is saying, if you really want him, for real want him, you know what to do in this moment. I don't even have to tell you. So I'm going to pray over you. I'm going to bless you. And then if you want to leave, um, you can leave, but if you want to stay, you can stay. If you want to, it, whatever you want to do, you can do it. Um, I just want to be obedient to God. So I'm going to pray over you, and then we'll, we'll be dismissed. Um, if anybody gave their life to Christ, let's give them a hand clap. If it, some people gave their life to Christ tonight. <clears throat> Woo, I'm so comfortable right now because I'm learning I can't do what God can do. I can't force anything on anybody. I can't be like, be healed. No, no, no. You got to want to be healed. I can only preach the word. So, Father God, thank you so much for what you're doing and how you're doing it. Thank you so much for the word tonight. Lord, we love you and we appreciate you. And we lift up your name. And we give you all the glory and all the praise. Help us do what we must do. Help us do what we need to do. Walk with us. Talk with us. In your name we pray. Everybody said amen.